this is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices Inside the Investment Committee, episode number one, was recorded on June 4th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. Inside the Investment Committee is a brand new show format. The whole idea is to take you inside the process that professionals use to source and vet macro trading strategies. Have you ever imagined what the conversation between a well-respected hedge fund manager and his trusted advisors and consultants sounds like as they discuss market conditions and consider macro-themed trading strategies? Well, that's exactly what we intend to bring you with this new podcast format. Our expert panel includes hedge fund manager Alex Garevich from Hunte Investments in San Francisco, along with boutique institutional investment advisors Julian Brigden, founder of Macro Intelligence 2, and Juliette de Klerk, founder of JDI Research. In each episode, we'll randomly select one of our panelists to pitch one of their very best trade ideas to the rest of the panel, who will respond critically, challenging the thinking and assumptions of the panelists proposing the trade. The whole idea is to give you, our listeners, the opportunity to listen in on the process professionals use to source and vet macro trading strategies. In some episodes, we'll talk about current market trading opportunities, but the downside to discussing today's trade is that we don't have the ability to discuss the outcome of the trade in the show. So in most cases, we're planning to discuss with our panelists one of their best past trades so that we can discuss not only the rationale for making the trade in the first place, but also what actually happened in the marketplace and how that market has evolved from the time of the trade to today. For our inaugural episode, MI2's Julian Brigden is in the hot seat. We're going to set the Wayback Machine to the summer of 2016 when Julian advised his clients to short bond markets generally and U.S. Treasury paper specifically. Was his logic sound? And how did that trade actually play out? Our panel will examine the rationale for the trade with a critical eye, and they'll discuss what was learned and how to benefit from those lessons learned going forward. So let's start by meeting our expert panel. Alex Garevich is a hedge fund manager with Hunte Investments based in San Francisco. Alex, welcome to the panel. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Eric. Good to be here. Thanks, Alex. And our next panelist is JDI Research founder, Juliet DeClerc. Juliet, thanks for joining us for this new show format. Hey, Eric. It's a pleasure being in this um, electronic room with such heavy weight. So thanks for inviting me. And uh, it will be um, really interesting to to talk about the past and and how it can be used to analyze the future. And also a great pleasure to rip Julian's past trade ideas to to (laughs) shred. Cheers, Julian. Thanks, Julian. And of course, finally, the man in the hot seat, MI2 founder Julian Brigden is in the hot seat this week. Julian, let's go back in time and pretend that we are speaking in July of 2016. And the three of us are among your institutional clients. So at that time, July of 16, bond yields were crashing below 1.5% on the U.S. 10-year. And a lot of people thought that that very clear downtrend in yields was set to continue. In fact, your own partner in Macro Insiders, Raul Paul, was saying very publicly that we were headed toward 50 basis points on the U.S. 10-year. But on July 7th, you penned a report to your institutional clients expressing a very bearish view on bonds, and that proved to be the right call. But Julian, our listeners aren't stupid. You're coming on to a brand new podcast format here, and you're starting. We said, who's got a trade to start with? You happened to pick the one where you perfectly called the bottom in bond yields in the end of what may have been a 35-year bull market in bonds coming to an end. So needless to say, our astute listeners are already questioning whether that was luck or skill that told you back in July of 2016 that it was time to short fixed income. So we have enlisted some very talented critics in Alex and Juliet. Juliet is raring to go to rip you apart. 
Their job is to make sure you justify why that trade made sense at the time you recommended it, not citing what the outcome was, but citing the evidence that was available at the time. So, Julian, please pitch your trade idea to the three of us as if we were speaking back in July of 2016 and rely on information which was known at that time in making your case. Alex and Juliet, your job is to keep Julian honest and challenge his thinking as if we didn't know how this trade was going to turn out. So feel free to interrupt his presentation if you have questions or criticisms along the way. Listeners, Julian will be referring to a chart deck which was first prepared back in July of 2016 in order to make his case to his institutional clients. That chart deck you can download from macrovoices.com. You'll find the download link in the description of this interview on our homepage at macrovoices.com. And I strongly encourage you to stop now, download the chart book, since Julian's whole argument for recommending this trade will be made referencing charts in that chart book frequently. Julian, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, thanks, everyone. Well, let me just first start off by saying, in reference to your previous comment, that luck always plays a role, but I think that you can try and create your own luck, and that's what we always do when we look at trades. So what we start off when ideally we're looking at a setup in the market is a sort of combination of factors. We like to look at the macro, we like to look at some positioning, and then we like to look at some technical indicators which help us time entry into the trade. So if we cast our mind back to the summer of 2016, if you remember, we had moved to the end of 2015, in quite an early 2016, quite a, a negative environment. We'd seen, starting as the Fed had ended QE, we'd seen a very rapid dollar rise from the middle of 2014 into the end of 2015. And this had been highly destructive okay it had wrought carnage through emerging markets it had resulted in a collapse in ism which is one of the key things we always watch from sort of 58 to 48 and we'd also seen a chinese devaluation and we'd seen a massive collapse in oil prices oil prices through a real combination but aided by this rampant dollar had fallen from well over 100 bucks to almost 25. And the net result is as we rolled into 2016, as the central banks all went off to Davos to drink champagne and to put their heads together, these guys panicked. And so what we'd seen in the spring and into summer of 2016 was an almost unprecedented wave of policy intervention aimed at continuing and reversing, so reversing certainly the disinflationary forces that we was, had seen into the end of 2015 and continuing the cycle. So if you look at the first slide that I put in here on this is slide two, you will see just all these various intervention points that we saw. I think we saw 25 in total by the time that we reached the summer. But it's incredible. I mean, I, outside the GFC, I'd never seen anything this intense in terms of policy. Now, what was the end result? Well, the end result was that we'd actually managed to initiate something that looked very reflationary at face value. So what we'd done is stocks had started to bounce, oil started to bounce and come off the lows by the spring. And it looked at face value that everything was good, that we had a true reflationary trend ongoing. But the bond market hadn't played along because the bond market was what appeared at face value sensibly following the rhetoric of the central bankers, which was exceedingly dovish. The net result, if you look at the next slide, is that you can see that we had a very extreme divergence between basically the S&P and the US curve. So the curve was inverted, twos, fives, which was suggesting a very bearish bond market outlook, that the bond market was desperately looking for the Fed to continue to ease, and yet stocks were sitting at the highs. 
And this to us was a sign of extreme divergence between bond and equities. Now, the question then was, which one was right? Was it the equity market that was right and that we had the reflation, in which case the bond market was horribly mispriced? Or was it the bond market that was right, in which case the equity market was horribly mispriced? So that led us to look at some positioning metrics. And we always like to do this because you like to figure where is the vulnerability within the marketplace. So one thing that we were looking at at the time is in slide four. So what you can see here is normalized to the start of 2016, we'd seen a massive feeding frenzy into fixed income ETFs and bond funds, massively outstripping both the flows into money markets and into equity. So sort of warning sign number one. The second thing is that we had seen a rebound, a significant rebound in risk parity performance. Now, we just used the salient risk parity index on slide five uh, as an example, but you can see how this has ripped higher and, and risk parity generally heavily long uh, fixed income. That's the largest uh, position. So this had led to this. So having had the big sell off in an underperformance of risk parity in 2014, 2015, as the dollar had rallied, these guys had come back. And I think we need to remember that globally, this was a time as uh, we were seeing you know, further negative interest rates for, and QE from the likes of Europe and Japan, that we were seeing this tsunami of cash pile into the US Treasury market because it was the only place with any yield. But what was interesting is that when we looked at reserve management growth, which you can see on slide six, which is generally a function of what the dollar does, albeit with a lag, the good news is that we were no longer seeing selling which we had as the dollar had rallied from 2014 into 2015. But it looked to us that there was just no way that these guys would be able to turn up as net buyers until early 2017. So we had this kind of window that we were looking at, which suggested that retail institutional accounts were very long and central banks wouldn't be net buyers. And that led us to the policy element. And really, if you go back and look at history, it's quite frequent that big bond sell-offs have been accompanied by policy errors. Those of you who listen to my podcast will know that I'm really not a great fan of what central banks think and do when it comes to the cycle. I think they're absolutely appalling at timing the cycle. As a friend of mine who used to work for the Fed and uh, for a very, very long time, he said, I was 42 years within the Federal Reserve. I never seen them call a cycle turn and they were always most bullish at the top. And I think that is absolutely fair. But you need, in a way, a policy error to push the market significantly offside. And I think the analogy that we were using was 1987. Why? Because if you look at this chart here, you'll see what we thought was a relatively similar setup. So going into the end of 1985, we had high bond yields, high Fed funds and strong oil prices. And then within a relatively short period of time, we get a collapse in oil prices. And the effect was to push inflation significantly lower. We all know that headline inflation is very, very oil sensitive. And as it collapsed, central banks eased. Now, as they eased, you started to offset that disinflationary pulse and oil indeed based and started to move higher. Now, the key thing with oil prices and the impact of inflation is not the level, but the rate of change. So you can see here that from mid 1986 into late 1987, our oil prices didn't rise much in nominal terms. We only went from sort of just under 10 bucks to just over, you know, almost 18 bucks. But in percentage terms, that's a huge rise. And that's what affects headline inflation. So central banks have eased, oil is lower, but is now recovering. Now, as that happens, inflation starts to mechanically pick up. But the point was is that Greenspan, 
in his inimitable wisdom, as a central banker, unable to see really what's going on here, said, oh, don't worry about this. This is still transitory. And the market believed him for a while. They believed him to a point. But as that inflation started to pick up, we obviously started to get the sell-off. So let's look again at what was going on in 2016. So if you look at slide eight here, you will see some inflation metrics. So you can see that underlying inflation metrics, the big metrics, services, medical costs, owner equivalent rent, you can see those on the top. They hadn't budged at all. They were still sitting at very, very robust levels of around 3%. But what a drag down headline was simply energy prices. But energy prices, you know, this is a year on year metric. So eventually that base effect will drop out. And the net result is that we expected inflation to move back up to where those other underlying metrics were, services, medical and owner equivalent rent. And we thought that would come potentially as a big shock. And we used the example once again, of the mid 80s as potentially some kind of roadmap that we can use. So you can see how first oil prices start to pick up and comes off the low, then stocks, which have been stuck in the range because they've been caught by between the benefit of lower bond yields, but the disinflationary pulse and the negativity that we were getting from oil prices, they then start to break up. And eventually, as the oil industry starts to pick up, industrial production starts to pick up, so the economy starts to look better, and then eventually bonds puke, for want of a better term. Now, we'd also had, at that time, a very negative non-farm payroll print. And this, in particular, had led to some very dovish comments from the Fed, once again, compounding that idea that we're in this disinflationary environment, we're not going to tighten anytime soon, and hence appeasing the bond bulls. But the reality is, is when we looked at our charts, it looked aberrative. In fact, we thought that non-farm payroll would start to rebound. When we looked at our underlying growth metrics, as you can see here in chart 11, they also suggested that growth was rebounding because, as we've just discussed, as the oil patch starts to heal and base out, they will bring rigs back on to, and you know, prices recover a little bit. They bring rigs back in and employment starts to pick up. And also their effect on the drag drops out from those, from that base effect dropping out in the year on year data. Now, a lot of people were also placing an awful lot of faith in the central banks. I mean, you know, we'd just seen Mario Draghi come out in early 2016 and say, quote, the ECB will not surrender to low inflation. But as I've said, central banks have an appalling record at timing cycles. And the ECB is absolutely at the top of the central banks that is the worst at calling the cycles. I mean, Draghi made that comment about not surrendering to, to low inflation right after the low in oil prices. In a very similar way, if you look at this chart here on slide 12, to what Trichet had said in 2008, you know, when they jacked rates twice going into the global financial crisis because oil prices were ripping, he managed to pick the absolute arse high. So we had little to no confidence in, in central banks. Now, where did it leave us? So we'd had this negative data. We'd had a very negative environment from the end of 2015, rolling into the beginning of 2016. Policymakers had thrown the kitchen sink at reflation, and stocks and oil were starting to respond to that, but bonds hadn't. And the reason that they hadn't is because they were still being driven by policy. And this negative rhetoric from the policymakers about inflation being transitory, needing to do more to guarantee the cycle. And they were essentially locked into low yields also by this flow that we were seeing from the rest of the world, this tsunami of cash that was coming into the US looking for a home and looking for any yield, frankly, they could get hold of. And the stories at the time that we were hearing from clients about being forced into, you know, in Europe, negative yielding bonds were just classic of the sort of excesses that you expected to see at a high. And yet, when we looked at it, policymakers 
who really had an appalling history of calling these cycles. And so the trade that we first recommended was the trade that you can see on slide 13, which was break evens. We'd had a stab at it back in December already. This is usually one of the first things that moved. And over the next month or so, we rolled into a whole bunch of stuff that was basically a play on higher bond yields, including a short in treasuries. So that's kind of how we approached the situation, and I'm happy to be ripped apart. Fantastic. Well, for our listeners' benefit, I want to just emphasize this entire slide deck that you've just been talked through was prepared in July of 2016. All of these charts Julian presented then, and I have actually seen a copy of the letter that was sent to Julian's institutional clients in even more detail than he's just given us, went through this entire case recommending that it was time to short fixed income. So Julian looks really, really good right now because because he's a very articulate man who's just presented a bunch of slides around a trade that actually worked. Standing by to make Julian look less good is Juliet de Klerk. Juliet, if you were hearing this in 2016 and thinking about it critically, what are the reasons that we might take pause and think twice about whether this was really the right move? Firstly, I'm, I'm going to go where I completely agree with Julian and and I actually have an interesting thought here when I look through what happened in the summer of 2016 through my reports. And what, what was really interesting is that, uh, especially given what happened this weekend, was that that's the time when Boulard, Fed Boulard, a dot changed from uh, basically one forever. And I think, as Julian indeed said, that was he actually called uh, the bottom in yield. But what's even more interesting is that he was the one on Monday who came out with the the call that the next move was going to be a cut. And so, you know, perhaps we've seen a, a, at least a temporary low in, to, in yields, like right now as we speak. Coming back to 2016, it's actually a time that I've, I have reanalyzed in great details at the beginning of the year, and I've actually written a, a full report on it and looking at like differences between 2016 and 2019. And that was basically meant to respond to Powell's comment that 2016 was a perfect example of how nimble the Fed can be. So I think it's not only a great marketing pick, but, but also a great pick as a topic, Julian. Let's go back to what moves markets, in my opinion. So I think for a central bank to affect the medium term outlook, it needs to be willing or you know, at least able to radically alter its reaction function. And, and that means basically loosening monetary conditions for a given activity level. And really what happened in 2016 was that the Fed relent worked beautifully because it came at a time when a whiff of reflation was already in the pipeline. But I'm really surprised, Julian, that you didn't talk about China. In, there wasn't actually we haven't talked about China yet, and and for me, that was really the one force that made your trade be right. So what happened in China is, as you said, which by the way is thirty percent of global growth, is that we had a credit impulse that actually bottomed in the middle of two thousand fifteen. And the credit impulse leads activity by about like nine months. So basically by the, the middle of 2016, we already had like huge reflation in the pipeline. And that's interesting, not only for the bond trade then, but also for the bond trade this year. So that, that would be my first thing. And, you know, if you want to reply to that, what was your thought around that? Because I'm surprised that it didn't make it to your pitch. No, I mean, I totally agree, Julia. I mean, we'd already seen that the way we approached it was that they, their devaluation had added to the panic that had caused other central banks around the world to, to join. And if you look and join the sort of reflationary game, and if you look already at what was going on, you know, in the first quarter half, you were already seeing signs of you know additional steps by the PBOC and the Chinese authorities to add to the mix so you know we had all these other underlying indicators that were you know our growth models were starting to pick up very sharply our ISM models were starting to pick up very very sharply and had been it's just in this particular and we've been stressing that to clients it's just that it was overridden and I find this you know I think for me as I approach 
certainly when I talk to my clients, I find, you know, we can be quite tactical in some of the things that we do. If I stress things, if I stress the long term trends too far, you know, in other words, sort of 12 to 24 months, then it often mixes the, the message. So I didn't particularly stress it in this report. It wasn't that we weren't watching it. We were. I guess what I want to say here is I don't think there would have been a 2016, 2017 reflation, or maybe it would have only been a modicum of reflation mm-hmm. if it wasn't for the coincidence of China and the Fed. Totally agree. Basically led to- to- weaker- totally agree. Totally agree. I think it, yeah. it, was a, it was a global, and that's why I love that first slide so much. You can see it was a global coordinated move with PBOC, the ECB, the Fed, the BOJ, you know, Bank of Italy, the Koreans, everyone, everyone. They all went on to off to Davos. They all worried themselves to death and they all came home and just fired the blunderbuss. Alex Garevich, unlike Julian and Juliet, who are advisors to people like yourself, you're actually running a fund. And fortunately for us, you are a guru in fixed income. So Julian's recommendation here is basically on a fundamental level, it's a trade on break evens. Is there just one way to trade that? Or are there different ways? And how would you as a fund manager, if you were going to take Julian's advice to heart, how would you put the trade on? Well, the proposed trade could be described very specifically through using very specific fixed income instruments. But uh, generally, the trade will be correlated very strongly with being short five-year treasury bonds. And what I would like to discuss, because in some sense, you need to short five-year treasury bonds, possibly buy inflation index bonds against them. But setting aside the complexity, the trade will basically trade like being short five-year treasury bonds. And I wanted to discuss this trade first, both from broad perspective, as well from uh, uh, specifics. To start with, right now is July 2016. I disagree with Julian. I do not believe bonds should be a shot here. I do agree that this is time to take profits. You should have been long U.S. Treasury bonds right now. First half of 2016, you made a lot of money. It is good time to take uh, decent profits. I think a modest long is still in order, and I will go through why. My first issue is going back to charts and just Look, look first at a very simple like chart-like and uh, price action-like environment. If we see what indeed U.S. Treasury bonds have rallied a lot this year in the first six months of 2016. But if we follow bonds around the world, JGBs had a much stronger parabolic rally. They could possibly pull U.S. Treasury bonds with them. In fact, if we look at... Uh, Longer dated U.S. bond futures, which are what I look more is like char- roll adjusted classical bond futures, uh, longer end of U.S. curve. It is in the channel. It definitely is overextended to the upside. But if there is a risk, there is also a risk of a parabolic breakout to the upside. And we can discuss later why this risk may be there. But I do not see risks as being asymmetric. Even at these extremely low yields, there is still quite a lot of upside to U.S. Treasury bonds. Because in the long run, yields are going to zero everywhere in the developed world. They may, of course, not go in a linear fashion. It could take a short-term sell-off. But in the long horizon, the forces, the inevitable forces of demographics and disinflationary world will bring all the yields to zero. And we would be fighting against the tide to be short U.S. bonds. Once I'm on charts, this is just one of my five points. But once I'm on charts, if you look at your chart five, which you describe risk parity, When I look at this chart, it's somewhat unconvincing to me. Risk parity seems mid-channel. To me, it seems, if anything, returning to its kind of having a temporary gap down, but now returning up and, in my opinion, returning to the much stronger trend that it had since 1998. And it seems like risk parity has a lot of time to go up. And when risk parity is... uh, has a positive momentum, there is really never any reason to be short bonds. The same view could be expressed by long stocks. Alex, before we move on to your other five points, let's get a reaction from Julian to that first one. So I think they're fair. I mean, you know, like all trades, when you're at that inflection point, it's kind of a, you know, you're 50-50 shot. But that's why we like to look at the underlying macro models, which way are they turning? 
And at the time, as I showed you with the, with the growth model and the employment model, they were pointing up. That was wholly incompatible with this incredibly bearish sentiment that we had that we had in the bond market. The same was true of the price action that we were getting in oil and stocks. They were incompatible with a continuation of the disinflationary panic that we'd seen in the latter half of 2015, early 2016. So to me, the macro models were turning. I actually fundamentally disagree with your demographics story when it comes to US Treasuries. I actually think that the demographics are based in terms of being favorable to lower yields in 2016. And I think, although the bands are hugely wide, when I look at the demographic patterns, they point to significantly higher bond yields as we move into the future. I think some conditions are necessary for that, but one of them is inflation. And as we looked at the comparisons to 1987, where essentially, Alex, central banks had essentially cocked up how to read oil prices, they had treated oil prices as a disinflationary stroke, deflationary pulse, where the reality of the situation is lower oil prices, even in the US with a very, very large shale industry, are transitory disinflationary. So in other words, they come into the data and a year later, as the base effects drop out, they drop out and are ultimately stimulative. So what we got exactly as we did in 1987, in early 2016, was a bunch of central bankers who were so myopically focused on flighting deflation that they panicked into what was ultimately a stimulative event and they just push the market to the extremes. And so to me, the risk reward was the other way around. And over the next couple of months, we had more technical indicators, which is typically the final signal. We used some proprietary metrics to go short US 10 years, which is 10 year treasuries, which is ultimately the best, uh, one of the better trades. But that was our framework. Alex, let's get both your reactions to what Julian said and move into your second question. Well, first of all, in reaction, I think we do disagree about oil. I believe that oil is, um, and I'm not quite sure of Julian's position on this, but I'm telling you mine. I believe that since oil is becoming, it's 2016, and oil, U.S. in the process of becoming energy independent and not so much of an oil importer, I think oil is just like anything else. When oil goes down, it's deflationary. When oil goes up, it's inflationary. And uh, same thing as prices for anything else. I don't think oil is any different from any other prices. It, it would only be different if it was a pure import. Now, oil is in a secular downtrend. It's basically its prices going down very strongly since 2008, especially on a total return basis. And uh, oil will be replaced and rendered very close to worthless a decade or so from now. And this is a huge reason why I believe for the impulse of bond yields going to zero. But uh, I do think we have a different view on this, and it's probably gonna, we're not going to probably have time to debate oil here fully. I imagine Julian has things to say about that. But uh, I would like to actually, if possible, um, let's just simplify things and talk about being short 10-year note, because it's very similar to the other trade Julian is proposing, but it might be easier for listeners to follow. And uh, because this is where I have some other issues. First of all, while I appreciate, as I said, that the, Treasury bonds, if you look at them in the charts, they're definitely overextended. And even setting economics aside, you could see that the rally has been overextended. They remain, when you look at them as related to themselves, on a relative basis, Treasury bonds, U.S. Treasury bonds remain to be one of the cheapest, absolutely egregiously underpriced assets in the world. And let me explain what I mean. Well, there's two different ways to look at it. First of all, the spread to bonds which is the closest relative, remains historically very wide because not only U.S. Treasuries rallied this year, but also Boons and JGBs. But even more importantly, the spread to the internal U.S. yield curve is totally makes them totally off the chart cheap. So the fundamental yield curve in the U.S. is not Treasury bonds. It's a swap curve because it's a curve at which people lend money. Currently, which is most exemplified in the 30 year sector, this year mostly, the year of 2016, 30-year treasuries were trading at LIBOR plus 50, that is negative 50 basis point spread, which is inverse to historicals where usually they trade more expensive than interbank 
over curve. 10 years are trading maybe around minus 15, and uh, so LIBOR plus 15 yield, or five years like LIBOR plus 10 yield. Now, in the most pronounced way in a 30-year sector, uh, if you factor in all the transitions of like the basis swap, like the fund, well, if you move from treasuries where they're trading LIBOR plus 50 to the actual value of the funding curve, that is where you can actually borrow money to buy them and convert it to the price, I computed U.S. 30 year treasury is trading at 85 cents on a dollar. That is, they're trading in deep default workout. 10 year notes, it's not so pronounced because it's just for the duration, but basically, U.S. treasuries are currently trading at default level. So, why would you trade an instrument which is, why would you short an instrument that is trading so cheap? As opposed to something else. So, I mean, look, you could you could obviously look at bonds, you could look at JGBs, you know, which were trading expensive because of the, what their central banks were doing. And in fact, we did have a stab at being short bonds and we did OK and then got stopped out. But it was, you know, it wasn't very much removed because the ECB was just constantly there. And so you were sort of resorting to essentially what the freely flight tradable instrument was. So, you know, you could have looked around the the world and found other bonds that were arguably potentially better. But, you know, our particular focus, as I said, it started off being five-year break-evens because it just, you know, our charts looked so very, very compelling. And then we shifted starting in very, very early August into selling 10 years as well. So 2nd of August, we put out a recommendation to sell 10 years with a pretty aggressive target at the time. We thought that they would move, you know, initial target on that was well above 2% and they were trading at about one and a half at the time. So I probably would also disagree with being short boons. I don't think it's a correct trade at any point because it's a trade that just never has any anywhere to go because rates will never go up in Europe, probably not in our lifetime. But uh, I... I think that following on your idea of being short U.S. curve somewhere, the correct trade would have been to be paying 30-year interest rate swaps because this year the low on interest rate swap has been 1.7% or somewhere around that, which is totally insane because they trade so – because the convexity paying in the mortgage market caused interest rate swap compressed so much compared to treasuries. What would you rather – we shot treasuries at 220 yield, 30 year treasury. So 30 year swaps is 1.7% yield. There are so many times, if you really think about shorting swaps at this level, there are so many chances to make money in the future on a future sell off. While if you're doing something in five year sector, you could very easily be proven to be wrong because events could go very differently in the near horizon and inflation could tick up, it could tick down. You're basically making a very short term bet with symmetric upside and downside. Well, you say that, Alex, you say that, but remember, I rely heavily on the models and the models were emphatically pointing higher to inflation. And look, I don't think ultimately whether we pick break-evens in the five years, shorts in 10 years or 30-year swaps, we're fundamentally disagreeing. You're just taking a different execution approach. And I'm not disagreeing that that is, was probably the better quality trade. But And I'm sure that you know, some of my specialist fixed income clients looked at exactly that sort of stuff. But when I talk to clients, I like to pick on the things that are more tradable to a wider cross section of uh, clients. OK, because I think and that's why I pick on 10 years, because there's a whole bunch of guys who are going to be trading, you know, whether they're in wealth management, can't trade 30 year swaps. Right, they don't have ISDAs in place. You know, there's a bunch of equity guys who wouldn't even know what a 30 year swap was if it bit them in the arse, right? But they will watch 10 year treasuries and they will price discounted cash flows off 10 year treasuries. So I tend to, as I said, pick the more commonly tradable stuff, which, you know, at times can be incredibly frustrating, but that's the reality of the situation. Yes, I appreciate that. I appreciate that position. Can I just say one more I think around this line of questioning and then I'll turn it over to Juliet because I've been hogging it for a little bit. Also, because you said, uh, Julian, you mentioned that you are more of a facts person. And my question is, if you were to execute this type of trade, why wouldn't you belong dollar yen instead? Dollar yen in a post-Brexit day, it just went down below 100. It's an excellent place to belong dollar yen with positive carry, which is likely to be increasing over time. And uh, 
a really good valuation point. Well, if you're short treasuries, you have to eat negative carry. And if you're on a 10-year treasury shorting it, yes, you might be tactically correct, but over the long run, you're not really likely to make money because even if rates go up, eventually they'll go down again. And so you'll eat some negative carry, then maybe some positive carry, then negative carry again. While with dollar yen, something like dollar yen or dollar Swiss, you'll be just earning positive carry all along. So why wouldn't you do that trade rather than to be short treasuries? The correlation is going to be very strong. If there is an inflation pickup in US, dollar yen will almost invariably go up. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. We actually, I'm looking at a piece that we sent out on the 12th of July, so a couple of days after we put this piece out, and we flagged the similarities between dollar yen, 10-year yields, euro stocks versus the S&P, a whole bunch of stuff. But the ones that we recommended were actually dollar yen, break of uh, 107, Aussie yen, a break above 8030, and dollar mex. So we did put in some, and we also recommended the Vanguard EM equity fund. So there was a slew of things, Alex, that were within that, that sort of mix. We weren't trying to pick the optimum one. You know, the FX ones were for my FX client base. The fixed income ones, for someone like you, you would have taken the information if you would agreed with it, which you didn't at the time, but you would have looked at it and optimized it for your portfolio. The point is we were looking at a, and the purpose of this piece was just to say, we were looking at a broad reflationary environment. And so you can pick your poison as to how to play it. Okay. Juliet de Klerk, let's go back to you. You've listened to this whole conversation between Alex and Julian. Is Julian uh, smart, lucky, or both here in this trade? So firstly, uh, I'd like to say I I really love the way uh, Julian's trade started, and and that's very much the way I like to look at things. Quite often, the best trades start when, like, everybody agrees on something. And if you don't get, like, a a structural move, you will at at least get a, a cyclical move. But in deciding whether Julian was lucky or smart, I think we also have to talk about what something that happened in in August, and that was with the BOG. And I'm talking about that today because I think it will really matter this year as well. What happened with the BOG is that they sort of like um, came out with something that I think I thought at the time was going to be a precursor to monetization. I can't remember if it was in August or September, but they basically moved to cap 10-year yields and basically, in my opinion, paved the way for an explicit cooperation between fiscal and monetary entities, which would be, in the end, tantamount to to monetization. And for me, that was where we were going to get the reflationary, the boost really that, in the end, Trump provided rather than the fiscal authorities in, in Japan, because they never really took on to the opportunity to like issue um, forever at like 10 base point and, and basically lower than nominal growth, which means that they didn't put their debt to GDP ratio in, in danger. But I'd like to hear what Julian has to say about that, because, you know, I think that the trade started lucky and it, it obviously like continued like smart. And I'd like to hear his view on how much the POG and how much obviously Trump mattered for, for the trade in the end. So, I'd flip it around a little bit, Julia. I'd say it started off smart, but I got exceedingly lucky. Because I think, you know, there's no question at this point that in July that we could see certainly Trump, okay? And neither could we see at this point, I mean, we were talking about what would the BOJ do next because they were clearly in a bit of a hole and we had a number of pieces that we sent to clients around that time. But it wasn't clear yet that, and to your point, I think you're absolutely right, that we were going to see yield curve control. And then within this context of renewed sort of emphasis on fiscal policy, we did actually in the piece that we sent out in conjunction with these charts in July, talk about how we were seeing some nascent signs of increased fiscal spending. We were seeing those in the UK. It was post-Brexit. There was talk of a big budget to offset some of the Brexit effects. We were seeing spending in Korea. We were seeing spending in Japan. So you were starting to, and we'd flagged it, but only really slightly because it wasn't clear. But as you moved into late 2016, and particularly in the United States when we saw Trump, and our policy contacts in DC were telling us emphatically that if this guy gets in, he is going to spend an inordinate amount of money. 
And that's when we started to look at a comparison, we think, which is still valid today. And that's the mid 60s cycle when you've got Johnson coming in and kicking off really aggressive fiscal spending situation. And we think the, the analogies to that just keep growing and growing every year, which is another reason why I'm not, a, you know, not for the next five years. I don't think I'm a bond bull. I'm a bond bear. I think in that sense, Juliet, we just kind of got lucky because those things started to build as a theme. It was in the back of our minds, but in July of 2016, you know, we started to think about these as issues, but, and they were sort of in the back of our mind as to that's the way that things could go. And we talked to policy contacts, which we, you know, from my medley days, I still have a lot. We had that kind of the, the tone is beginning to change that, you know, passing the baton from monetary to fiscal, we actually discussed in a piece after the Jackson Hole meeting in 2016. So it was sort of there, Juliet, but, you know, I have to admit, we were bloody lucky that Trump won, right? There's no question that his his win in the election catapulted that trade to yet higher levels. I mean, I just told you that when we first put the trade out to short 10 years, a couple of weeks after this particular presentation, our initial target was 2% and obviously went way, way, way beyond that on the back of the fiscal spend. Yeah. And I think that that's that's the really interesting thing about like 2016 and and the reason why actually your trade in the end didn't have long-term legs is because central banks, basically, they don't create wealth. They just ensure that future wealth is realized today. And I think that sort of like rejoins to Alex's view on uh, that rates are in the end going to zero. Well, we'll have to disagree on that one because of uh, of what I believe is coming in fiscal. But um, and, and the fact that I think that central banks will accommodate that, uh, which is why I think we're looking at a situation right here, right now, which is more akin to sort of 1966, 1967, and that we've got our BEX next wave coming up in bond yields. Uh, as and when we see weakness, which induces further policy response. That's just why I'm not a long-term. I think to believe that bond, long-term bond yields are going to zero believes that the only players left are monetary policy, you know, like we've had in, in Japan and uh, in Europe. I believe that in the US, we're teeing up for some very aggressive fiscal spend in the next couple of years. And I think it's, it's all going to be about monetization, basically. And that's what the 2020 election is all going to be about. Well, folks, I would love to continue this part of the conversation quite a bit more. But in the interest of time, I, I want to go and look kind of fast forward. Julian, you had several strucks of both luck and genius that got us all the way from less than one and a half percent to over three percent. Now, we interviewed you several times along the way on the Macro Voices podcast, and you started telling us, look, the real big test here is going to be when we get to around, and the specific number that you called out was three and a quarter, three spot 25 on the long bond, the 30-year bond. And you called our attention to the 100-month moving average. You said, look, if we get a, a monthly close above that 100-month moving average, that's going to be a first since the mid-1980s that that has happened. And you said we would really need to see that breakout to really confirm that the 35-year bond bull market is over. And you brilliantly called that level, Julian, because that's exactly the level that was tested but it turned out that it was tested. We did get the monthly close over the 100-month the moving average, but it was a fake breakout. It didn't last, and bond yields have been collapsing ever since. So what does that mean in terms of how this – obviously, you got the trade right for the duration that you recommended it. But now we're moving on into how this trade has evolved in – the subsequent time and into the current market, bond yields have been, they tested the level that you said they would test. That was the final test. They didn't break through. They're coming back. Does that mean Raul Paul was really right? We're headed back towards 50 basis points? Or does it mean that there's just a little corrective wave here before what you originally saw really plays out? So what I'd like to do next is get everybody's perspective on how this trade evolved and how the market has evolved and where we are now, because Julian's trade played out beautifully. We got all the way up to that 2008 peak in bond yields. They've been crashing ever since. What comes next? Julian, let's start with you because you got the last trade, right? <laughs> well, actually, we've been long treasuries for a while now. We actually 
put the position on or recommended people buy 30 year treasuries at around, uh, I think over, just over sort of 313, 310, something like that. And our initial target was uh, 270. And obviously, we've blown through that on the back of trade, on the back of the wobbliness of the US financial markets. My gut here is that I would certainly be tightening stops. I think that um, there is a risk that we've seen a blow off move. I mean, the, the move over the last couple of days since Sunday's session in Asia in at the front end of the euro dollar curve just smacks of blow off kind of move. But, you know, I do worry inordinately about how this trade talks are going. I think that we, the US equity market faces some significant headwinds in terms of this move to, we say, a less business-friendly environment with the DOJ opening antitrust suits against a bunch of people. This is something we flagged to clients at the, uh, I think, start of this year. Uh, we wrote a couple of pieces called RIP, Corporate Capitalism. So I am, I am worried about that. But ultimately, I think that the worse things get in the short term, the more likely we are to elicit a policy response, both in terms of monetary. I think Powell's whistling Dixie if he thinks that he isn't cutting rates, he's cutting rates and he's cutting rates a lot. And also potentially in terms of more fiscal spending as we move into early next year, particularly if the economy looks as though it's slipping into recession. So to me, short-term pain which could push yields a little bit lower. They do look very stretched right here right now, but could push yields a little lower. It's just frankly an opportunity to sell again, because as I said, I think big picture, unless you believe we're all going to turn Japanese, to use that uh, great title from the Vapors song from the mid 80s, which I do not, I think bond yields are going higher, particularly in the United States. Let's go back to Juliet. Juliet, Julian says, big picture here is it may be not exactly now, but what you should be doing is looking for when the time is right to sell fixed income again. Is that the right move? Because I know you've written quite a bit to suggest the opposite. I mean, I've been calling for like a 50 base point cut since um, February this year. And I've been saying that the Fed overhiked uh, last year. But as Julian said, now we're pricing like 75 base point cuts. So it would take quite a drastic move in financial conditions for this to be delivered anytime soon. So in, in the short term, I've actually like um, taken profit on, on, on fixed income. Going forward, I think the really interesting thing is really going to be whether we see monetary and fiscal cooperation. And But I think also that th there's not going to be a fixing of a crisis without a crisis. And the issue at the moment is that because of um, a central bank's uh, hyperactivity, we're not getting a crisis. They're basically killing the symptoms, and which basically makes the disease more likely to become, to become chronic. So, um, but I think that will be basically the, what's at stake, or at stake in, in 2020 in the US election. And, and we could be talking a lot more about monetization, about the fact, something that I spoke about in a recent interview with you about the fact that if you grow nominally higher than where your rates are, you can actually spend as much as you want. It's, it's not going to blow your debt to GDP ratio. And that could really get rates higher again. But in the short term, I don't see like any resolution anytime soon. Alex Gurevich, what are your thoughts in terms of how the market looks now with respect to fixed income? Okay, so... First of all, as I mentioned before, I've been continuously long U.S. fixed income. I've been long U.S. fixed income in one form or another every breathing second of my time for the last probably seven or eight years. What I've regulated is the sides and the portion of the curve I've been long. My view is that rates are going to zero. I absolutely think that we will be like Japan, that an all developed market is going that way. And we, that's a matter of a separate debate. However, as of a current positioning, I do not possibly disagree with Julian as much as it might appear, because I do believe that rates, short-term rates policy will be very aggressively cut. I believe that policy will go to zero by the end of 2020, and I've been positioned that way specifically for rates to go to zero by the end of 2020 since probably early 2018. My view on this has not changed. However... From experience of historical patterns, I know that the long end of U.S. interest rate curve actually performs rather poorly when easing cycle actually starts. So I've been 
definitely trying taking profits in the long end and even establishing some steepening positions to prepare for the beginning of the easing cycle because I think what will happen is that people will be surprised by how much rates will be cut and how much the very front end will rally. And people simultaneously will be surprised how poorly the long end may respond to those cuts. Well, everyone, this has been a fantastic conversation. I want to turn the conversation now to the subject of our next episode. We need to pick a different trade, although, frankly, it's tempting to continue this conversation. We could probably do a whole other episode on where we go with fixed income from here. But, Alex Gurevich, we already decided before we taped this that you are in the hot seat for our next episode. You will be making the pitch, which Julian made today. What is uh, a quick summary of the trade that you'll be telling us about in our next episode? Okay, Eric. So I would like to go a little further back in time to 2014. In the year 2014, I was writing my book, The Next Perfect Trade, A Magic Sword of Necessity. This book came out in 2015. As I was writing this book, I was in real time analyzing the trade, which I thought was the perfect trade of that time, and which I've managed to identify as one of the two best trades to my knowledge, to what I have found in all history of all markets. And uh, that trade in 2014 was actually a combination of two positions, to be short euro and to be long, long dated U.S. Treasury bonds. And that's the trade I would like to discuss. Well, Alex, we're really looking forward to our next episode when we'll get into that trade in gory detail. Meanwhile, before I let you guys go, I want to just ask each of you to tell our listeners where they can find out more, follow your work, and learn more about what you do. Alex, let's go ahead and start with you. You run a hedge fund for Hante Investments. Yes, so my name is Alex Gurevich. The easiest way to follow me publicly is to use my Twitter account, which is like my first initial A and my last name Gurevich, A-G-U-R-E-V-I-C-H-23. That's my Twitter handle. I have a verified account and it will link you to my some of my past blogs and to, to the book that I've mentioned in the podcast. For accredited investors, there is a website for my firm, H-O-N-T-E-I-N-V.com, Honteinv.com, where you could... Uh, register if you qualify and then get access to our more private information. And there is there might be some public things posted there as well. Juliet de Klerk, JDI Research, tell us more. Hey, so um, if you're a professional or passionate and committed high net worth, you can find, find out everything about JDI Research Service on my website, www.jdiresearch.com. Or if you just want to hear which football team I support and occasionally get some good trades, you can find me on on Twitter at uh, Juliet JDI. Thank you so much, Juliet. And of course, Julian Bragdon, the man in the hot seat from MI2 Partners. Now, James Bond worked for MI5, I believe. What's MI2? <laughs> um, don't tell my wife that. No, like every good British boy, obviously I should be James Bond. But there was actually a um, an MI2, as was an MI3, four, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that existed till just after the First World War, and they were in charge of uh, geographical intelligence. And since I set up a business with my wife, we thought that MI2 uh, on multiple fronts was appropriate. And MI obviously standing for not military intelligence, but macro intelligence. So, yes, if you're an institutional investor, you can get hold of us at support at mi2partners.com. Alternatively, if you'd like to follow us and Raul at uh, Macro Insiders. And as you can imagine from this conversation, there's at times some quite heated discussions, which I think most of our clients find uh, pretty useful. You could also contact us at support at mi2partners.com. Alternatively, just follow me on Twitter which is at Julian at MI2. Well, thanks for that, Julian. And we really look forward to seeing all three of you on our next episode. Meanwhile, listeners, we need your feedback. Macro Voices Inside the Investment Committee will be produced monthly at first, and then we will reevaluate the schedule based on listener reaction. But there's more to it than that. We talked through a historical trade which led into a discussion of how that same market looks today. Is that the right format? Should we be looking at trades that start and end in the current market? Market? Should we look entirely at historical trades? We've had lots of ideas. We've kicked it around inside the committee here, and we need your feedback. 
So we welcome any comments and suggestions and requests that you have, whether it be for future topics or about the format of the show. And I'll take this opportunity to share my future programming plans with our listeners. I'm really excited about finding new show concepts and formats that will go beyond what others have done before in financial podcasting. Today's episode of Inside the Investment Committee was the first experiment in that journey. I'm constantly considering new show concepts and formats all the time, but I can't do this alone. I welcome your suggestions and requests and your ideas for what the next killer podcast format should be here on the Macro Voices Podcast Network. So please let me know your ideas for what the next show format or the next episode of this show should be about. You can give us your feedback on Twitter or via email to me at info at macrovoices.com. Now, we can't reply to everyone because the message volume is just too high, but I do promise that we read every single message that we receive. So that's a wrap for our first episode of Macro Voices Inside the Investment Committee. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. 